Hello everyone, this is Chuck Carnivale, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. This is my second part of a long series I'm going to be doing on illustrating and focusing on dividend growth stocks that have already entered bear market territory. Today's video is going to be on Kimberly Clark. Kimberly Clark is a trusted consumer staples company known for their products including Huggies, Kleenex, Scott, Kotex, Cottonelle, Poise, Depend, Pull-Ups, and others. However, what I think is really important, let's take a look at the FastGraph now. Let's, I'm going to start with adjusted operating earnings here or adjusted earnings non-GAAP. And what I want you to see about a consumer staple like Kimberly Clark is they're not a really fast growing company. I've got the growth rate going from 2002 here and you can see the company's grown earnings at 4.7 percent on average. However I want you to notice there was a down year during the Great Recession followed by a pretty good year by the way. Then again, another down year and a flat year, followed by a couple of good years, a down year for fiscal year 2013, followed by some pretty good years thereafter. And then, you know, currently estimates are for decent growth going forward, but this is not a high growth stock. I think you can think of this stock as a, we'll say a five to 6% grower. If I chop this graph down from 2006, you see growth has been 4.9%. I chop some more years off, growth has been 5.2% over this time, dropped a few more years off, and growth is now 4.4%. So this is a 4 to 6% grower over time. You know, every now and then they do bring in a really good year, but you should have proper expectations when you're analyzing a stock like this. It's really all about the dividend. So let's, let's bring the dividends and the dividend payout ratio into the equation here. And what I want you to see is they're a pretty consistent payer. If I go down to the performance results, you'll see that they've routinely paid, you know, 30 on the low side 40 on the mid side and 50 percent of their earnings and more recently they've been paying out about 60 percent of their earnings you can see a little acceleration the area below this white line represents the portion of earnings that they pay to you the shareholder if you happen to own the stock and then of course i'm going to take this level of earnings and stick it on top now i want to talk a little bit about intrinsic value this orange line represents a pe of 15 and i think it's important because i had some comments come up in my last article on General Mills. Intrinsic value is important to understand, but the idea that if a company's growth rate changes, their intrinsic value changes is not necessarily true. Think about it from the perspective of a fixed income, like a CD or a bond. Any investment that generates a stream of income has an intrinsic value based on that income. Now, the rate of return it's going to generate is functionally related to how fast it grows going forward after you buy it and whether or if it's in a case of a fixed income, whether it doesn't grow at all. But that doesn't change the intrinsic value. So just as I said with General Mills, the intrinsic value of this company sits at around a 15 times earnings using a widely accepted formula. Discounting cash flows comes out to about a P.E. ratio of 15. Now let's look at real world evidence of that. So let's bring monthly closing stock prices into the equation. And what you see here is the price tracks this orange earnings line, but it does get disconnected. This represents theoretical fair value or intrinsic value, if you will. And you can see periods when the stock gets overvalued where the PE got up to 19 here in April. And that obviously led to an expended period of time, especially coming into the Great Recession, where performance was very, very poor. And that's something I want to make a couple of comments about. This is not the kind of stock that's going to outperform the S&P 500 on a capital appreciation. So let's take a look at it here when it's reasonably valued. This goes back to 2006. And it's just moderately overvalued today, but we have about a 4.9% growth rate and we get very similar capital appreciation, averaging 4.7%. However, the S&P 500 over this time frame would have given you 6.5% of capital gain or capital appreciation. This is without reinvesting dividends in either case. However, what I do want you to notice is what Kimberly Clark will do is outperform the S&P on dividend income, no matter almost what period you're checking. I'll shorten the time frame here to a 10 years. I still have decent valuation. Once again, we got dividend income dramatically exceeding the S&P, but not necessarily beating it on a capital appreciation or a total return basis. This is an income vehicle. It's not a I'm going to make you rich vehicle or a 10 bagger you know, potential as Peter Lynch talked about. It's an A-rated company. Now it does have a lot of debt relative to a lot of companies, but we'll look at cash flow here in a moment 
to illustrate that the company is able to support its debt and continue its dividend rate. However, before I do that, I do want to bring in also a normal PE calculation. I want you to understand what this is. The fast graph tool simply goes in and attempts to identify what PE ratio has been most common over whatever time frame we're graphing. So here, going back to 2002, we have a normal PE of 16.9. If I drop that to a 12-year graph starting in 2009, keep in mind I've got estimate data here. This isn't all history. Now I've got a normal PE of 17. I drop it to eight years. It's a normal PE of 19. But again, if you look at it from this long-term perspective, this is including a period where we had very high valuation. So suffice it to say that you've got a stock here that trades at around 15 to 16 or 17 times earnings normally. Now, the point is, it doesn't mean it's okay to pay 17 times earnings, or in this case, you know, 17.7 times earnings. What it does mean, though, and I'll shorten the graph, and now I've got 16.9. Those are all very similar numbers. These are valuation references. Obviously, the best time to buy a stock, any stock, is when the price is below the intrinsic value line, and the lower the better, because that's going to give you the best chance of making what I'll call excess profits in addition to what the company's growth potential is. Nevertheless, Less, this is a kind of a stodgy old consumer staples company that got significantly overvalued, you know, from really starting in 2013, really, and it persisted all the way through 2017. If you measure it from the peak, you know, which is the kind of the bear market, I didn't quite hit the peak there, but you can see that it's been down about 17% off of its peak, where the stock price is moving back into better alignment with some kind of rational valuation, if you will. But the real key I want to emphasize here is the evidence that you're looking at. This is the real world here. These are valuation references. And you can see, you know, a 15 PE is optimum, a lower PE is even better. A PE of 16 or 17 is not unusual, but when you get PEs up here into the 20 range, like we saw back in you know March of 2016 and May of 2016, these are excessive valuations. And even though nothing really changed about the company, earnings growth during this period of time was you know 5%, 3%, and then they had you know this year we're expected to see 11%. But notwithstanding that growth, the company still was fighting the headwinds of overvaluation. But this stock is now coming into reasonable valuation based on operating earnings. So let's also look at valuation from a standpoint of dividend yield. These are year-end, fiscal year-end dividend yields. And right now we've got a current yield of 3.8%. So if I go and find that yield, you know, in December of 2011 or December 31st or the beginning of 2012, we had a 3.8% dividend yield. You can see at that point in time, the stock was trading at a reasonable PE ratio, as I've been articulating here at about 15. So from that point to now, you would have made 9% owning the stock even after this reversion to the mean. That's important, but I also want you to notice that you got nice steady dividend increases each year. When we look at the dividend column here, we can see that the dividend increased in 2000. It was $1.08 and went to $1.12, $1.20. And this company has steadily increased its dividend and grow those dividends at about 7.5% per annum. Now, something else that I often talk about when you're analyzing dividend stocks, I really like to look at operating cash flow and value these stocks because this is all about the income. As I pointed out already, this isn't really going to beat the market on a capital gain, but it should beat the market very handily on a total dividend income, both current yield and future yield going forward. So when you look at that from a valuation perspective, a normal priced operating cash flow of about 13 is a very conservative number. It's currently trading at a priced operating cash flow of 12 and a half. So from a valuation standpoint, based on cash flow, it looks attractively valued. But more importantly, dividend coverage is also quite good. So let's move on to free cash flow or what's left over after the company spent all the money it needed to to run the business. And what we see here, the company also generates ample free cash flow. Now, in fiscal year end 12-31-2015, I do want you to notice that they were paying out over 100% of their free cash flow that one year. But otherwise, it's normally around 40 or 50%. But the company does produce ample free cash flow to cover their dividends. So even though the company has debt, I believe their cash flow story is quite strong. And then from a valuation perspective, let's look at it again from EBITDA or earnings before 
interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And we see also that the stock normally trades at a normal EBIT of about nine and a half. It's currently trading at a price to EBIT of about 9.1. So what's happening is this company has gone through a correction from an overvaluation state. And as I said in my previous article, got a little flack from it, I'm going to try to clarify my position. Nothing's really changing fundamentally about this business. The growth rate's going to you know, hover around that 4 to 5%. Only thing that's really changed is the market value or the fact that the market was really valuing this at a high valuation a couple of years ago. I just see that as investor optimism. But anytime you see valuation like that, in my view, you're always exposing yourself. Even if you go back here prior to the recession of 2001, when you see high valuations, you put yourself in a position where, you know, if not, in other words, if you look at it back here, you put yourself in a position where you're probably going to get suboptimal performance going forward just because you're overpaying for the stock. With a company growing at four to five percent or six percent, it's very important that you only invest in a stock like this when valuation is sound. So let's move on and look to the future. Let's look at analyst estimates. There are 10 analysts forecasting 4% growth for fiscal year 2018 ending in December. And then there's 10 analysts that forecast another 2.5% going forward. So we've got about a 3.6% forecast on average, which is slightly less than their historical norms, but you know, reasonable nevertheless. If I go and look at the trend line growth rate, we've got three analysts that do expect this company to grow at about 6%. I often like to take the custom calculator here and combine the near term estimates with the longer term estimate. And what you've got here is, is more of the same with Kimberly Clark. It's not going to make you a great deal of money going forward. But at a 3.8% yield, that's a historically a very attractive yield for the company. It should generate decent income going forward. And that's what this recommendation to start looking at Kimberly Clark is all about. And by the way, I've designed this tool to help me research the stocks further. I've got good valuation here. I've got a decent yield. So there's a couple of things I can do right from my fast graph. I can go right into the company's website as I just did here, I can go into the investor center and I can look at the annual reports, filings. I can also look at events and presentations. And I did a, you know, show a couple of slides there. But in addition to that, I've got external links here. I can go into Seeking Alpha, for example, and I can look for any recent articles that have been written on the company. I can also go into their earnings tab here and I can, you know, access their most recent slide deck, which was April 23rd. And I can go through these slides very quickly. I can enlarge them here. And one thing about these slide presentations that I think is important for hopefully the viewer to understand is when these analysts are making these estimates, that I alluded to a minute ago here, what you're seeing is the product of them attending those presentations and looking at those same earnings forecasts and also listening to company guidance. Now, from an analyst scorecard point of view, Kimberly Clark has produced a reasonable scorecard. If you summarize it, if you look at the one-year forecast, analysts have missed 40% of the time, but that was a couple of years ago. Their two-year forward forecast, ironically, they've only missed 20% of the time. So if you look at more granularity here, you can see that they missed analyst estimates pretty heavily in 13 and 14, but in 2015, 16, and 17, they actually came in slightly below analyst estimates, but they were close enough within a reasonable margin of error, which just simply tells me this company is not that hard for analysts to estimate. Now, what I'm really suggesting here with all this is it's really all about going and digging deeper into the company. Now, with me, I use the fund graphs tool and I like to go into places like look at, at gross and net profit margins and I'll shorten the time frame here. Their net margins have actually been increasing in 2017. And if I look at their quarterly data, I see a pretty you know, consistent, the March quarter of 2018, we haven't got the current quarter yet, was actually pretty low, which might also partially explain why the stock is down a little bit. When I look at the company from a standpoint of share buybacks, they were buying back stock during the 13, 14, 15, 16 overvaluation area. I'm not really too fond of that. I like the fact that they might be buying stock back today. But the moral of the story is when you look at a stock with a valuation like this, it might be time to take a closer and deeper look into the company, its fundamentals and its potential. But the point is, I don't even bother with that when the stock price is trading at excessively high valuations. I won't get interested in conducting comprehensive due diligence until I think valuation is reasonably sane. 
Anyway, this has been Chuck Harneville taking a look at Kimberly Clark, another one of these dividend growth stocks that were so popular just a couple of years ago that are now starting to move into a more reasonable valuation level. Thanks for watching.